Hi everybody and welcome back to chapter 7 in our first video. Here we're going to look at valuing inventories. Let's look and see what is in store for us. After studying the chapter, here's our learning objectives. We're going to look at how we identify inventory classifications, uh, determine the goods and costs included in inventory, describe and compare the cost flow assumptions used to account for inventory, identify some special issues related to LIFO, and finally determine the effects of inventory errors on the financial statements. So, as we preview Chapter 7, here we're going to look at some inventory issues in classification, cost flow, and control. And then we'll look at what goods and costs are included in inventory. What are included goods? What are included costs? And which cost flow assumption to adopt? We have cost flow assumptions. We have a summary analysis, a basis for selection, and then switching methods. And then our special issues related to LIFO, which are the LIFO reserve, LIFO liquidation, dollar value LIFO, and the comparison of LIFO approaches. Okay, and then the effect of inventory errors. What happens if ending inventory is misstated? What happens if our purchases and inventory is misstated? How does that get corrected? All right. Now, let's identify inventory classifications and different inventory systems. Inventories are assets, as I'm sure you know by now, that are held for sale in the ordinary course of business, or they are goods to be used in producing the goods to be sold. So, for a merchandising company, they only have one inventory account, and that's merchandise inventory. And here it is, merchandise inventory. And we purchase merchandise already in final goods form. And then a, an example would be Walmart, as they use here. You go into the Walmart store, buy their finished goods, and away we go. Now, manufacturing companies have three inventory accounts, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. And we break them into the categories as you see here for Procter and Gamble Company. Okay, so if I look at the way a manufacturing company works, we're gonna buy our raw materials, then those will flow into work in process, and then labor, and we apply that labor, and that goes into work in process, and then we have some overhead, which goes into work in process. As we, as we complete those in work in process, they then go into finished goods. And once in finished goods, either we retain them in finished goods inventory or they are sold as cost of goods sold. Merchandising companies, very easy. We have the cost of goods that we purchase and when we sell them, that's the cost of goods sold. Okay. This, this cost flow illustration is very useful for a variety of for a variety of different kinds of inventories but here we're going to take our beginning inventory and the cost of goods that we purchase and that's going to give us the cost of goods available for sale so then the cost we either do one of two things we sell it or we keep it very easy so, if we look at the computation of cost of goods sold here, we have our beginning inventory, 100,000, right? 
and the cost of the goods that we purchase or produce during during the year and that gets us to the total cost of goods available for sale and then we can inventory what we have in ending inventory and we would know then that that difference is going to be the cost of goods sold okay perpetual system a perpetual system is when our inventories are perpetually calculated and we know what they are like ikea for example if you go into ikea and they show in the little kiosk that you have <coughs> five little black desks and you purchase one of them and go out the door with them their inventory is going to be adjusted right there they will tell you they will know that you have four little black desks left and they will do a debit to um, um, either accounts receivable or cash and the credit will be to revenue for what you pay for it but they'll also have the second entry which will be a debit to cost of goods sold and a credit to inventory all right so under a perpetual system here the purchases of merchandise in a merchandiser is debited to inventory pretty straightforward there where students sometimes get confused freight in for that merchandise if it's fob um, um if it's fob site of manufacture then you're going to be the receiver you're the buyer you're going to be responsible for the freight in and that is part of inventory purchase returns and allowances discounts are credited to inventory <laughs> cost of goods sold is debited inventory is credited for each sale as i just illustrated with my ikea example and the subsidiary records show quantity and cost of each type of inventory on hand now a periodic system is different a company determines the quantity of inventory on hand only at the end of the period to do so they have to know all the acquisitions of inventory during that accounting period they will know the purchases and then they know the beginning inventory and so then they can compute the cost of goods sold by going in and uh, inventorying ending inventory and that the residual will be the cost of the goods that have been um, uh, sold okay here are illustration of the difference between perpetual and periodic inventory here's trader joe's and they have the following transactions related to jars of their famous cookie butter spread <laughs> okay the facts to illustrate the difference between a perpetual and pre periodic system we're going to assume Trader Joe's had the following transactions. Here's their beginning inventory, 100 jars. They purchased 900 jars. They sold 600 jars. So their ending inventory is 400 jars. So how should Trader Joe record those transactions in a perpetual and periodic system? Well, here is the perpetual side when we go back here we purchase 5400 units so we're going to update inventory debit it and credit accounts payable to pay for it um, accounts receivable is going to be when we sell it let's go back are selling 600 jars at $12 for $7,200. So when we sell that, we'll debit accounts receivable and credit sales revenue. And we know that the cost of those 600 jars was $6. So our cost of goods sold 
Let's go back. Here's the uh, cost of that. It's six six dollars here. Um, we know that that cost is six dollars, so we can now debit cost of goods sold on the income statement and credit inventory to reduce that by thirty six hundred dollars. So the inventory account shows the ending balance at twenty four hundred dollars. That's the six hundred dollar beginning inventory plus the purchases minus the ending inventory. All right. So now if we did that on a perpetual or on a periodic basis, it's a little bit different. Here we use the account purchases compared with inventory over here. We're going to have purchases and accounts payable. Uh, as we sell it, we'll have the same entry here as we did for perpetual, but no cost of goods sold yet because we don't know what we sold, in a sense, the, the, the price of it. So we go out and we count the ending inventory of 2400 And so we know that we had an available inventory. Here we go. Available inventory here of a thousand jars valued at um, um, six thousand dollars. So here we know if we've counted ending inventory, that means if I subtract that six hundred six thousand from twenty four hundred from six thousand, I get thirty six hundred for my cost of goods sold. And it balances out with my purchases and my beginning inventory of 600. All right. Little tricky with periodic inventory. All right. Inventory control. All companies need to take an accurate inventory accounting system. So we'll think about what happens if a company does not stock enough in inventory it might lose sales. I think you've all had the situation where you go out and try to buy something and they didn't have it. So you may go someplace else to get it, or you may be patient and wait for it. However, it's still aggravating. And uh, you might lose a customer to your competition who can provide for your needs better. So what happens if a company stocks too much inventory? Well, the inventory is expensive and it may be too expensive and the inventory also could age and become obsolete and lastly what happens if a company does not adequately protect its inventory they could walk out the door through theft or if we move them around a lot they could be damaged so good inventory control is important for those reasons Let's look at inventory shortages. At the end of the reporting period, the perpetual inventory account reported an, an inventory balance of 4,000. But you go out and do an annual physical inventory, for example, and you find that only 3,800 is on hand. How are we gonna record that write down of inventory? Well, the answer is fairly easy here, but not necessarily intuitive. The entry is going to be a debit to inventory over short and a, and, um, a credit to inventory to write it down. The inventory over short is reported on the income statement in other revenues and gains, other expenses and losses. Sometimes companies use a cost of goods sold as, in place of the inventory over short, but this is a more ele elegant way to do things. All right, that looks like a good place to stop this video. And when we return, we'll take a look at putting this into practice. Until that time, bye for now.